My name is Stefan van der Walt. I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley. I come from uh, South Africa, where I'm an applied mathematician, um, or pretend to be at least. And um, yeah, uh, today I'd like to talk to you about Scikit's image, the image processing toolbox for Python. Um, Scikit's image is slightly different than many of the other projects you've seen so far. So a uh, project like NumPy, Pandas, they're fairly widely applicable to all sorts of different domains. Uh, Scikit's image is the only project here that's uh, fairly focused on the specific domain of, uh, in this case, image processing. Um, but um, yeah, the domain of application for image processing is vast. Uh, image processing is used in science. Uh, you see it in micros microscopy, uh, astronomy, biology. Uh, it pops up in computer vision, in engineering, uh, and that's but to name a few. Uh, in Industry, we see image processing happen in interesting places as well. Uh, robots controlled in industry to perform automated inspection or control of production, uh, used to process satellite data. Uh, we, uh, at the Strata conference, there was a talk on uh, augmenting sports television. So for example, when baseball players uh, pitch, they want to know uh, where did where did the ball land, you know, what was the angle of throw, the speed, et cetera. Uh, and a lot of that is done with cameras following uh, objects around and a lot of image processing happening behind the scenes there. Um, and then there are some toy applications, you know, like when you scan uh, these little micro arrays, the little black and white patterns that you see on conference posters, advertisements, et cetera, uh, some image processing happening there as well. Um, for me personally, what's make, what makes this uh, project so appealing is uh, that we're really pushing the limits of what the current Python tools can provide us. Uh, we rely on base packages such as NumPy, uh, but we actually require more than what those tools can currently provide. So we love programming in Python, we love what the current tools can do, um, but we need more than what they can currently provide. So we get quite excited by uh, all the new developments that are happening in that domain as well. Uh, so like I said, uh, we've got fairly high requirements of these tools. Uh, the, for example, speed is an essential requirement for us. Uh, people might want to do real-time processing of image streams um, or work on extremely large images. Um, uh, but without compromising on the aspect of speed, we also uh, want it to make to make it easy for people to process images to to uh, easily express the operation they want to perform uh, in a high level language but still have it execute um, extremely rapidly so for example when travis uh, proposed yesterday um, a solution where you can inject functions into numpy uh, using something like lvm that kind of thing gets us very excited because we'll be able to program in python but um, still get the high performance benefit uh, down the bottom um, we often need to uh, leverage uh, different pieces of hardware available, like multiple CPUs, GPUs, you know, we've got backends to, to utilize OpenCL, et cetera. Um, so uh, those, uh, making use of all those platforms or all those, uh, you know, hardware capabilities also <coughs> pose some extra uh, challenges. Um, and then all of these things need to be exposed to the user in a way that doesn't make it uh, difficult, difficult to use. Uh, we've learned a lot along the way in developing Scikit's image. Uh, we've learned how to build robust pipelines, uh, make it easy for users to string together a whole bunch of image processing functions uh, and, and just have that work uh, without doing any magic. Um, in those pipelines, we need to very efficiently transform data. So uh, interesting things happening there and then uh, deal with all the different ways that people represent their data. There are some subtleties when you represent images, like where is the center of a pixel? You know, a pixel is a little block. You can think of it as a little block of color, uh, or you can think of it as a data point. Uh, so is the origin of that data point in the corner, in the center, you know? Um, what kind of data types do you use to represent your images? We'll talk a little bit about uh, that later on as well. 
And then finally, it's been an interesting experiment in building a small community. We're, we're fairly small. We're like uh, four or five active developers. And um, so, but we're not part of the big uh, uh, sci-fi project at the moment. You know, we're doing our own thing. We've got our own website and so on. So it's been interesting to see how that all came together. Uh, so uh, if you look on the screen here, I've got a layout of roughly how all these components fit together. So most of, uh, most of our package is actually built on, on top of Cython. So we, we leverage Cython to get speed. Um, and uh, NumPy built on C primarily, also using some Cython for the num uh, random number generation, for example. Um, so like most of you know, on top of NumPy, we've got the higher level utilities such as uh, SciPy, uh, matplotlib that we use uh, extensively, and yeah, on top of that, scikit's image. Uh, ND image comes from, uh, I think it might be from uh, Numeray. Uh, it was developed in the astronomy community, at least by Peter Fafir. It was integrated into SciPy. Uh, but ND image is written in pure C. It's a little bit hard to get people to develop on ND image because it's hard to wrap your mind around it. So um, with scikit's image, we try and make a much easier entry point into image processing um, and aim to vastly extend the capabilities of ND image. So, just to give you an idea of what is available in SciPy, so in ND image itself, um, let me. Uh, Let's go to, um, if you just go to the SciPy docs. All right, so you see in the in the image package, we've got uh, in the image filters. So just common filtering operations. Uh, filters relying on the Fourier transform. There's some interpolation uh, that we need when we do geometric transformations on an image. So when you warp, when you skew an image, um, you apply spline filters, for example, and then some uh, methods for doing measurements on images. Like if you've got a whole bunch of uh, image areas, how do you measure the size of those areas, how many there are, et cetera. And we'll see an example of that just now. Um, some morphological operations, they operate on the structures inside an image. And um, yeah, that's about it. So what I'd like to do is to run through a typical example of how would an industry problem look? And how would we solve such a problem? All right, so I'm going to import ND image as NDI. Um, right, so there's the problem definition that we have. Um, uh, where's my image? There we go. So this is the image we'll be working with. Uh, it's a microscope image of some uh, heated up glass. So there's a description. Um, they say that uh, this specific glass sample, uh, the glass is the light gray background that you see there. Um, there's some bubbles, black bubbles in there. Um, and uh, unmolten sand grays, those are the light, the uh, slightly darker gray that you see in between. And when you've got a slide like that, what you typically want to do is count how many different uh, types of each phase there is. So what area of this image essentially is covered by the light gray glass background? What fraction is covered by the black bubbles and by the, uh, the sand, the dark gray? Uh, how many bubbles of each kind? Um, what's the average size of the bubble? How many bubbles are there? Uh, that sort of thing. So how would we approach such a problem? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to get the image uh, from the disk into the computer. So can you all read uh, what it says here, or should I make it a bit larger? It's okay? Yeah. Uh, right, so we, um, we start, uh, in this case, I'm just going to use ND image and matplotlib to show you what those tools can do, and then uh, I'll show later on how Scikit's image builds on top of that. So we load uh, matplotlib. We're just going to use that to read the image. We import NumPy as well. And we use matplotlib's uh, imread function to read in the image. Um, and then 
we display the image. We specifically set the color map to gray because by default there's, uh, I think, wh which is the default color map, John? It's, it, it's jet, right, typically. Um, so you see like a whole bunch of colors usually if you try and display a gray image. So we set it to gray by default and uh, importantly set the interpolation to nearest because otherwise if you zoom in on the image, it will uh, you know, smooth it out as it interpolates those points for you. So we just set it to nearest so we see the exact pixels that we loaded in. Um, the first problem we have is that the uh, microscope in inserts a banner here. So we just want to get rid of that banner. That's fairly easy to do with NumPy. Um, the image we loaded is simply a NumPy array, so we can apply all the standard NumPy operations to it. In this case, um, I just choose to take the first 880 rows, throw the rest away, so that's the part of the image um, without the banner. So there we go. Okay, so just discarded that bottom bit. Uh, now, you'll notice that there, oh, you can't really see it on this, uh, on the screen too well, but there are a whole bunch of speckles inside these black blobs that we don't want. So how do we get rid of those? Uh, well, in this case, I ran a, a median filter on it. A median filter is basically just a, a windowed operation. So you slide a window across the image and inside of each window you say, um, let's pick the middle value. So you sort all the values, you just pick the middle value. And that tends to get away, uh, rid of speckle noise, you know, very high and very low values. So, um, so that's what we do next. Right, and there you can see the, um, the phases seem to be much cleaner. We don't have uh, as many speckles lying around. Uh, now, we, the next step we need to do is to separate out those three phases. So we've got the light gray, the glass background, we've got the black blobs, and then sort of the dark gray sand grain. So how could we separate those out? What could we do? Any suggestions? Yeah, oh, I forgot that you guys can see the solution. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, so, um, so what we want to do is we want to basically set up three different masks. We want um, to threshold this image in two different places, basically take all the, light, uh, all the darker pixels, all the lighter pixels, and then the gray pixels in between. But we don't know where to take those thresholds. So the way we investigate that is to, um, is to plot a histogram of all the values inside the image. And when we do that, you can clearly see that there are uh, like three different modes here. So this would be the zero intensity uh, pixels, so that those are the black blobs. Uh, these are the darker gray sand grains, and the white here, or the, the light gray, is the glassy background. So um, where would be a good place to threshold? I think I picked uh, 50, so took those values out, then all the values between 50 and 120, and from 120 upward. Right, so that's exactly what I do here. I say, uh, create three different masks for me. Uh, this operation, um, it's a truth test. It says, is the median filtered image less than or equal to 50? So that will return a Boolean type ND array for me. Uh, true or false values it will be a mask for the bubbles, the sand, and the glass. And then I just have a little bit of code there that, that plots all three of those. Right, so there we go. We see the original image, we see the bubbles isolated, we see the sand, and we see uh, the glass. What would be convenient is if we could take all these layers and combine them into a single visualization. So how would we uh, do that? Well, typically we represent images as an M by N array. Uh, and that array is then just contains intensities. Uh, but you could also make an M by N by three array. And those three layers would then be red, green, and blue. So we construct a new uh, empty image of the same shape as the original, except we add that extra dimension of RGB. And uh, then we proceed to fill those layers with uh, different values according to the masks. So uh, wherever there are bubbles, we write the value red, no green, no blue. Uh, for sand, we 
we add red and green, but no blue, and for glass, no red, no green, and for blue. All right, so that gives you a very nice, uh, convenient, single representation of your different phases. Much easier to recognize than on the original image, and it also shows you what you labeled. Um, now, if you, if you notice here on the edges, you still have some uh, yellow coming out on the red. So there's still some mixing up on the phases here on the edges, and we'd like to get rid of those. So uh, what we're gonna do is apply uh, a morphological operation. Morphological operations change the structures inside an image. So we're going to try and get rid of these little speckles. We do that again by moving a window over the image and saying if, uh, if there are structures that aren't entirely contained in this window, uh, throw them out. Um, what that typically does is it tends to uh, grow structures inside the image. So we actually change the, the size of these bubbles. So then we basically do the inverse. Uh, we say, move that structure over the image again, but everything, um, you know, uh, yeah, everything that, that is not contained, uh, uh, select that. So then we, we shrink the structures again and um, hopefully get rid of, of these uh, extremities without changing the size of the bubbles too much. So we apply a bi what they call a binary opening and a binary closing and um, there's our final phases that, we, um, that we're going to work with. Um, all right, so what's the next step? Now we want to figure out, we, we know we, we've got bubbles, we've got sand, and we've got glass, but how do we count how many bubbles there are? How do we uh, count how many sand grains there are? What, what, what's the average area of those things, etc.? So the first thing we do is we, we label our components. So we go through this image, and we say, uh, identify all the isolated blocks of, or connected blocks of pixels um, and give them different values. So we'll start and we'll say, ah, yeah, we've got a blob of pixels. We'll label that uh, one. The background is typically labeled zero. So this will be one. Uh, scan, 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 scan. Ah, there's another one that's two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we'll just consecutively label the different connected uh, components in the image. Um, right, so that's what this call here does, uh, in the image label. It steps through the image, labels all of them, and then we have this single line of list comprehension to uh, calculate the statistics we want. So it says, uh, for each label i in the range from one to the maximum label, uh, find all pixels with those labels, so where the labels are equal to i, and um, just count, just count how many of those there are. So that gives us our uh, number of object areas. All right, so there we go. These are the labeled images. They plotted with uh, the very useful spectral color map, which changes fairly rapidly um, over, over the integers. So you can see uh, all the different colored uh, bubbles coming out here. The glass is mainly a single uh, blob, it's the background, and then some, some others coming out, but mainly the big background one, lots of sand grains, and um, yeah, they are the statistics. So 150 regions found in the sand, 70 in the bubbles. Uh, that makes sense, so we've got more sand than bubbles, um, and many fewer in the, in the glass phase. And, uh, as we expect, the glass phase has got an average, a fairly high average size because it covers almost the whole uh, image. And the sand grains are typically very small, but there are plenty of them. Right, so you know, that's a, that's a typical uh, image processing pipeline that you, that you might form. Um, yeah, so I, ho I hope that provided some insight. Uh, now, Scikit's image builds on top of the SciPy and ND image tools. Uh, I'll show you the, the homepage for the project. Let's, uh, let's go there. Let's 
So there we go. This is a pretty standard template. You, you'll see the IPython web page looks very similar. We kind of borrowed from them. Um, and so you can download the project here. We've got uh, you know, our user guide, a gallery of examples, where to get the source code, and uh, some, just a, a trivial example on the front page so you can get started quickly. Um, I encourage you to go look at the gallery. It's probably one of the most fun places to browse around and just see the kinds of things that people have done. This isn't an exhaustive list of what's available in Scikit's image, but it does give you a, bit, a quick preview. So, um, for example, we've got a marching squares algorithm. So if you've got a, a height map of some sort and you want to follow contours along that map, you can use the contour finding. Um, you know, we've got uh, numerous edge detectors. And uh, here's an example of some histogram equalization. So if you've got a, an image like, such as this one with very low input contrast, uh, you can choose different ways of scaling it. You can either try and linearize the cumulative uh, histogram or you can uh, just sort of stretch the contrast a little bit uh, to provide an image like that. Uh, we've got some, uh, this is a cute example where we took a natural image, just split that image up into uh, little windows and then did uh, um, k-means on, on those images, those sub-images as features. And you see when you do that on the original image, you basically get something that looks like Fourier components. But when you do that on um, the edge edges in that image, or the difference of Gaussians, uh, you get these Gabor-like uh, features, uh, you know, codes were coming out. Uh, we've got the Huff transform for doing straight line detection in images. We've got uh, radon transform reconstruction. So that's uh, when, you, when you do a CT scan of the brain, you scan the brain from all the different directions and it sums it in all the different directions. That gives you something called a sinogram. And based on the sinogram, well, this is what your scanner gives you. And if you want to invert that, you do some filtering, you do the inverse radon transform, and you can do a reconstruction of your image. Uh, then some uh, segmentation, feature detection, um, denoising. Yeah, so that gives you a rough idea of the kinds of things we do. So here's a typical example uh, from the Scikit's image module, I imported uh, data, filter, and I.O. So data is where we typically get our sample images from. So in this case, I used the coins sample image. But then I apply, applied the Sobel filter to that image, and I uh, display that image. There we go. So I.O.imshow uh, typically makes use of matplotlib by default, but we've got a whole variety of different uh, output uh, modules that we can use, output plugins. So you can display using Qt or matplotlib or whatever's available in your system. Uh, we've got, we just basically want to make it easy for users to uh, display images irrespective of what they've got installed. Uh, but you could just, it's a NumPy array, so you can just display it using normal matplotlib. That would work fine. Um, in the same way as we have uh, output plugins, we've also got several input plugins. So you could use the Python imaging library to perform image reads by specifying io.use plugin uh, full imread. And then when you read the image, it is read with, uh, with the Python imaging library and not with matplotlib. So some... Uh, some uh, libraries allow us to do interesting things. We've, in our Qt backend, we've got a fancy imshow. So if you decide to use plugin Qt for image display and you specify the fancy parameter equals true, you'll see something interesting happening. We've got, uh, we pop up a little display like that. So 
your um, your image is displayed with histograms on the side. These uh, histograms um, are updated if you adjust the colors in the image. You can see, look at the red histogram as I adjust the red component. You'll see that um, it goes higher up. This all happens multi in, in uh, several processes. It splits up the process to more rapidly process the image. And um, if you notice here at the bottom, you can follow the, the position of the pixel, the value, uh, the, the position at the, at the cursor, the value, uh, the RGB values at the cursor, view saturation value. Um, all right, so let's adjust the image somewhat. Let's uh, go to gamma and, well, let's first adjust. I'll add some, some green to the image. Just slide that up a bit. Then um, this is a, a little bit like revision control. You can choose to commit your changes or you can choose to revert them. So you make cumulative uh, changes to your image and you can move up and down that stack. Uh, so there, that's committed. Uh, now we can go to the gamma adjustment and just push up that gamma value way up or way down. That looks kind of cool. Let's do that. And um, then here's a button called uh, save to stack. So we've got, well, let me commit that and make this thing a little brighter. Okay. So I'm going to click save to stack. So we keep an image stack around. If you push images onto that stack, you can now go back to your notebook and grab the image off the stack and manipulate it further. So I'm going to close this viewer and I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to say io.imshow, uh, io.pop. So io.pop goes onto the stack where I just push that image, grabs it out of there, and then we can display it. So Often you want to read uh, files coming from different domains. Like in, in astronomy, they use uh, the FIT image file format. Uh, you might use DICOM images if you're working in the medical domain. Um, and we've got different plugins for these. So in this case, I'm going to say use the plugin FITS and then try and read this star image. And yeah, there we go. There's the image. Now, one of the biggest problems we've had with, uh, oops, I'm going to do that. One of the, uh, did I just kill my notebook? Oh dear. Um, so, so people uh, use images uh, with different uh, value ranges, and this, this becomes quite problematic. For example, uh, typically you'd store your image as a, as a floating point array and all the values would be between 0 and 1. But other people store the images as uh, unsigned uh, integers uh, ranging from 0 to 255, or uh, bigger integers running from 0 to 65535. Uh, some people store the images running from minus 128 to 127. So how do you deal with all these images uh, in a way that's not too confusing to the user? So uh, we. We basically d support all of these, but we assign very specific expectations. We say like, if your image is in floating point format, the values must be between zero and one, otherwise we don't know uh, what you mean. So uh, we've got several conversion functions. Uh, so you can call images float, images unsigned byte, images unsigned integer, or images int, and it will convert your image to that new representation, taking into account the, the ranges of the image. And these functions are typically called at the beginning of any filtering operation. So uh, the image, the, the filtering operation takes in any image, any data type, converts it to what it needs, and then uh, spits out whatever is most convenient. But because all the functions take in uh, any kind of image, you can string these together, and it should always just work out of the box. 
So I guess my kernel's still running. So let's, yeah, so it's all fine. So um, here's that NGC image that I just loaded in, the star image. And if I print the minimum and maximum, you'll see that it ranges from 100 to 65535. So that was actually an integer image. But the FITS plugin, uh, well, the FITS PyFITS library in Python returns a floating point. Uh, so we, don't know, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to handle an image like that because the values are outside the range 0, 1. So if you try and filter an image like that, you should see an error. And uh, that's what happens. It tells you, well, your image uh, should have been values between 0 and 1. But to handle that, we've got a function called rescale intensity. So if you know what the ranges of your intensity are, you can, uh, you can call uh, this function. And in this case, I didn't provide any parameters to tell it what the ranges are. So it just picks 100, the minimum value in the image, sets that to 0, picks 65535, which was the maximum value, sets that to 1, and uh, returns that for you. So if you try and uh, filter the return image, should be no problem. And uh, yeah, that's what we see over there. It's uh, no problem. You can also tell uh, the rescale intensi intensity function what you expect the range of your values to be. So we've now changed this image to have values between 0 and 1. But we can tell it, well, let's say the maximum was 0.25 instead of 1. So what would that do? That would discard all values above 0.25 and stretch 0.25 to be the maximum value. And when you do that, you see that this is a much brighter version of our original image. So here's an illustration of the conversion function. So, uh, I took that image and I applied, I, I first converted it to float using image as float and printed out its maximum value. You can see it runs from zero to one. Uh, then I converted it to integer. You can see it runs to the maximum integer value, or if you convert it to an unsigned byte, it runs to 0 to 255. Now often, uh, when you want to test your algorithms, you need access to some test data. So we provide several test images uh, in the data sub-package. So if you import the data and you use um, data.camera, for example, you get this guy out. Um, data.coins is this uh, image. And if you call data.coins question mark in IPython, it just loads the doc string for you. And you can see that we've got, it uh, says those are Greek coins from Pompeii. It tells you a little bit, bit about the history of the image, what it's typically used for, uh, and what the copyright situation is, you know, where it was obtained from. So if you want to use it in your paper, we try and use images that are freely available, so you don't have to worry about that. So like I said, uh, it's important to image processing users to be able to construct a pipeline without any hassle. And with a, with a, you know, if you work with ND image, for example, you constantly have these problems where you convert an image, but the range is outside of what was expected. So uh, if you, for example, take an image, you multiply it by two, and you display it in matplotlib, you typically won't see any difference because there's just some automated scaling that takes place. So um, that's why we have these functions that make sure that if you multiply your image by two, you actually see, see the, you know, twice the intensity. Um, so let's look at this example of constructing a, a pipeline. I take the camera image that I just showed you. Uh, I don't know what format that is in. It doesn't matter. Uh, the canny filter knows how to handle that. So that's what's plotted over here, just the plain edge detection. But if I first want to apply a total variation denoising on my image and then do the canny filter, I can just string them together like this. I don't have to worry about the ranges, the data types, nothing. That's all taken care of. I just string them together. That's my pipeline. And when I display the result, uh, there it is. So you can see the um, if I just applied the canny edge detector detected a whole bunch of spurious edges if I first denoise the image and then applied uh, much, much cleaner edges. One of the algorithms we implement is called shortest path. And I want to show you this 
uh, video on how shortest paths are typically used in. Um, so let me try and make this. Let me. I'll just sort of narrate as he uh, goes along. He's doing a context sensitive resizing here. So he's explaining that on a typical Wikipedia page, if you shrink the page in width, uh, you'll see that the image remains constant in size, even though the text reflows to fit nicely. So this is less than, than ideal. Uh, here's an example of a bear and a cub. If you try and uh, shrink that photo, you typically end up with a difficult situation. You either have, uh, you know, you crop the image, so you, you cut out the piece, so the bear is here, but the cubs are over here, you can't see them. Uh, or you scale the image, but then everything is kind of squished up. Or you cheat a little bit and you retarget. So here they, uh, they took the image, they're trying to change the aspect ratios, um, and so this is the retargeted image. This is what happens when you just squish the, Im uh, oh, there's the image squished, and this is the image cropped. So you can see that um, over here you've got all the content you want, but without changing the aspect ratio or losing too much of, of the image content. You can see that all the features remain inside the image, even though we're rescaling it, even if you stretch it out. Um, so he wants to shrink the width of this uh, image of the blocks. How is he going to do that? Um, so what they show is that they do edge detection on the image first. And that helps them to decide which paths in this image can we, can we carve away. They call this technique seam carving. So the idea is that your eye is much more sensitive to edges than to smooth areas. So if I, um, if I took out a path in this image that ran here, you know, avoiding all the edges, then my eye probably wouldn't notice what's going on. So I think it's first going to illustrate now what happens when we just take, take away columns in the image. Right, so it's now just removing columns depending on the columns that cross the fewest uh, gradient uh, or, or it's, yeah, that crosses. So there's the edges again. And then they detect the path that runs along the fewest edges and they keep removing those one by one. So blue to red is just the order of the seam removal, so you can see which ones are removed first and last. And here he inserts uh, pixels to, to grow the image. This is a good example. They try different things using edges or saliency or whatever. Um, but in the end, gradient magnitude seems to be fine for what they're trying to achieve. Sometimes uh, features get removed from the images that you don't want removed. Like in this case, look at the baby's head. That wasn't too good. Um, so you mark the areas that you, that you don't want to remove, and they basically get increased uh, penalty values. So they don't get selected for removal.
this is this is a great example. Like, if you don't want that guy in your picture, you can actually uh, select him and say like, we'd prefer the least the cost path to go through there. So, gone. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that's a, that's a technique called seam carving, and uh, we actually have an implementation of this using the shortest path algorithm in, in Scikit's image. Often we want to geometrically transform images as well. So you might want to take an image and downsample it. So in this case, I started off with a cameraman image and I called ndimage.zoom with a zoom factor of 0.1. So scale down the image by 10. Uh, and when you do that, you get this as output. You can see this is much more blocky than, uh, than the original. Um, sometimes we want to be a little bit fancier than that. So in Scikit's image, we have the transform module that does all sorts of different transforms. Uh, the, we can specify this uh, transformation matrix here. So it's a three by three transformation matrix. This matrix is applied to each coordinate in the image and whatever comes out, that's where the coordinate is moved to. So uh, those of you with a background in linear algebra will recognize the first two by two sub block of this matrix as a rotation matrix. We've got cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine. Um, the S's in there are just for scaling X and Y. Uh, we've got translation parameters here, TX and TY, that's for shifting the image around. And then some skew factors, S0 and S1. So if we just want to do zooming, like in the previous example, we simply set S equal to uh, 0.1, and then we, we shrink the image down by, by 10 times. So let's do that. Um, we call transform.homography with that matrix, and there's the output. Now, you'll see that I cropped the output by just selecting the uh, first 50 by 50. If I take that out, you'll see what's really going on in the background. We take the image, we size it down by 10, and that's what's, what's stored down there. Uh, but you can do slightly more interesting things. You can... Uh, rotate the image, so let's say we want to rotate it by 15 degrees, maybe translate it by 100 in each direction, and add a small skew factor. So, oh, large skew factor. Oh, my scale is still 0.1. Let's, uh, let's not do that. So I'll set the scale to 1. There we go. So there you've got a linear warp of the image. Now, um, in the image also provides the um, a, a map function because this is a linear transformation. All straight lines in this image remain straight lines over here. And sometimes you want to do nonlinear transformations. So there's the coordinate map function. And um, let me see if I can execute that demo. Uh, Right, so here's a, a, a photograph of a window frame, but you can see that there's severe distortion on the edges of this image. These lines are supposed to be straight, but they are very much curved, and we'd like to pull them out. So what I do is I provide the script with the straight lines. I mark three points there, uh, one, two, three, and let me do another line, so uh, one, two, three, and then there we go. So based on those, I gave it three, three coordinates and asked it, please optimize the warp so that those three points lie on a straight line, and this is what you get out. So I didn't do a very good job of marking, I, uh, but these lines are much straighter than they were in the original input image. Oh. 
Recently, we've also added support for block views and filtering. So often, you just want to slide a window across your image, do some operation on that window, and return the result. So if you, uh, if you look in the uh, shape utility, you import view from Windows, uh, view as Windows. You can take your, uh, your input image, view it as a bunch of windows. So that's the sliding window. It's just a view in the original image. So there's no copying of data taking place. You can do this on a fairly large image. Specify the shape that you want. Um, so uh, your input image is 512 by 512. You now break it up into blocks of 20 by 20. Um, so your output is uh, 493 by 493. It's almost the size of the original input image, but these windows have to fit inside the image. Um, and each block is 20 by 20. Uh, and then you can do some operation on that block. Like you can get the maximum of the entire block. And if you display that, there we go, you get something like that out. So you can clearly see the the blocky structure of that filter coming out. If you're looking to detect features in your image, you can do, you can call the HOG, the histogram of gradients on it. Uh, that basically examines the, in, the image at each pixel position and it looks at the gradient and it counts uh, the number of gradients in, in each direction. And uh, here's a visualization of that. Brighter pixels indicate uh, more, more uh, gradient found in a certain direction. So you can see, you can basically see the original structure of the image coming out. Uh, lots of vertical here along the, the pipe and, uh, sorry, horizontal and more vertical um, along there, for example, on his shoulder because the gradient runs horizontally there. Right, so I think, uh, I think that's about it. Um, if you're interested in image processing or you, uh, you can use some of these utilities, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, we like to, to welcome more people into our community. And uh, it, the mailing list is populated by guys who know a lot about image processing. So feel free to come and ask questions or just discuss the tools uh, we're using. Seems like we're done. Right, thanks very much. <laughs>